This video looks at diagonal canonical forms for state space models. The previous video then showed how to form a state space model from a transfer function using a control canonical form. Where a system has got only, we emphasize this, only real and distinct poles, one alternative is the diagonal canonical form. Now being diagonal, this has got some advantages in terms of computational advantages and insight, but you should note the states have less physical meaning. They may not correspond directly to a displacement or a velocity or a temperature. They may relate to nothing physical. Also, you'll need to use partial fractions. Partial fractions then. Assuming real and distinct poles, a partial fraction expansion takes the following form. So the first thing you do is you factorize the denominator. So you write it as a product of factors. Once you've done that, you find the residue for each factor. And you'll notice here that we've got an r over s plus p1, an r2 over s plus p2, and so on. Now, I've done this very quickly. If you want to look at this more carefully, you'll find if you go to the inverse Laplace part of the website, you will find lots more on partial fractions. So state space and partial fractions. The first thing we need to do is do the partial fraction expansion and then we're going to define an independent state for each partial fraction term. In essence, what you're saying is I'm going to get a state space model for that term and then a separate state space model for this term and so on. But I'm going to put all these state space models into a single matrix for ease. So this is how we do it. You'll see a state space model for R1 over S plus P1 can start with the term dx1 dt equals minus p1x1 plus u, and that will reproduce the pole s plus p1. A state space model which captures the r2 over s plus p2, God, I keep putting that in the wrong place, sorry, is given by dx2 dt equals minus p2x2 plus u, and so on. So you'll notice I've got a separate first order ODE to represent each partial fraction, but you'll also see I've ignored the r's. So I've ignored the residues for now, and what I'm going to do is reintroduce those in the output equation. So the output can be defined as r1x1 plus r2x2 and so on. So if I want to do a state space from a partial fraction, I first of all take each partial fraction and write the corresponding differential equation, but without the residue, and then the residue is reintroduced in the output equation. Let's do an example then. So here's a partial fraction, r1 to rn, and you'll see the state space model. I'm going to put minus p1 in the 1, 1 position, and you'll notice that the top row here, so if I've put circled in red, that top row captures x1 dot equals minus p1 x1 plus u. Now if I look, for example, at the nth row, so I'll put this nth row down there. What equation has been captured by that nth row? And you'll see I've got xn dot equals minus pn xn plus u. So you'll notice I've got a separate row for each differential equation that goes with each of the terms in the partial fraction expansion. And then I reintroduce the residues in the output matrix. So I say the output is going to be r1 times x1, r2 times x2, and so on. Now, hopefully it's obvious to you, but one key thing about this state space expansion is that the A matrix is now diagonal. So it has a very simple form. An example then, find the state space model for the following, and the first step is to do a partial fraction expansion. You'll notice I have factorized it for you already. I've told you the poles are at minus 1, minus 2, and minus 3. So the first step is to find the residues, and I've done that for you um, to save time, and you can see I've got minus 1 over s plus 1, 5 over s plus 2, 
and minus 4 over s plus 3. And now the state space model, I'm going to take the first term, this minus 1 over s plus 1, and put it in the first row. So the pole is at minus 1, so that's in the 1, 1 position. The residue is minus 1, so that's in the first position of the C matrix. For the 5 over s plus 2, that's got a pole at minus 2, so I've put that minus 2 in the 2, 2 position, and the residue is 5, so that's in the second position of C. And finally, the minus 4 over s plus 3, that's got a pole at minus 3, so the minus 3 is in the 3, 3 position, and the corresponding residue is in the third position of C. So hopefully you can see that once you've done the partial fraction expansion, defining the A matrix, the B matrix, and the C matrix is straightforward. What happens then if I have repeated roots? And this is slightly more complicated, and we're not going to dwell on it overly, but it's worthwhile viewers having some insight into what you might have to do. So where a partial fraction has repeated roots, a slightly modified or so-called Jordan form is required. And we're going to illustrate this with some simple examples. So here you can see I've got a G of S which has got a repeated root. So when I do the partial fraction expansion, I've got an R2 over S plus A squared and an R1 over S plus A. For those who are familiar, this corresponds to a, a mode T e to the minus AT and e to the minus a t. What about h? h, you can see I've got a cubic form of the pole, a quadratic form, and a single form. So this root is repeated three times. So it's going to give me three separate terms in the partial fraction expansion. And so you're asking yourself, OK, how do I put these into a state space equivalent? Now what we're going to do is we're going to show you the solution by inspection rather than deriving it because if you're happy that the solution works you can just use it. So if I've got a double root you'll notice what I've done is I've put the pole in the diagonal so it's appeared twice so I've put it in the diagonal 1-1 one, one position and 2-2 two, two position but the interesting thing is I've added this extra term up here above them. I've put this extra term 1. So the A matrix has got the poles in the diagonal matrix, but it's also got this 1 in the up just above the diagonal. Now, the residues, R1 and R2, have been put in C, and we'll see where those residues come in in a minute. Now, if I write down the Laplace transform expansion of this state space model, I'm using this formula here, SI minus A inverse times B. And so SI minus A gives you this matrix here, or SI minus A inverse. I'm not going to do that slowly. You can do that yourself if you want. So I've just given you the result, and the result is given here. Now, if I multiply that out by multiplying by the B matrix, you'll notice you get an interesting result. The interesting result is you've got a 1 over S plus A squared in the top row, and a 1 over s plus a in the bottom row. So by using this particular definition of a, I have managed to get a Laplace transform that has this pole in its quadratic form and in the single form. Now if I just look on the previous page and remind you of what I was looking for, I was looking for r2 over s plus a squared and r1 over s plus a. So now you, I've actually put it back to front, which is a bit naughty, but anyway, you'll see that with this particular choice of C, then this R1 is going to go with this term, and this R2 is going to go with this term. So what you're going to end up with is R1 over S plus A squared, and R2 over S plus A. Let's do a third order example. Now this is similar to the second order, but it's worth doing just so you can see the pattern. I think it's very rare in practice that you would get anything beyond uh, a cubic term. So now you'll notice what have I done with the A matrix. Again, I've put the pole in the diagonal positions. Because it's the pole appears three times, I've got a 3 by 3. So it's appeared in each diagonal position. And again, I've put these values of 1 in the upper diagonal. So 
just the single upper diagonal and because it's cube here we've got two ones. Now we'll do the same as last time we'll take the Laplace transform so there's the formula SI minus B inverse times um, B and if you do this particular algebra again I'm not going to do it slowly for you because it would be a bit tedious you see you get this particular expression here you'll notice you get the s plus a cubed in the denominator and then you get all these other terms in the matrix above but if I multiply it out what's the key result top row has 1 over s plus a cubed next row has 1 over s plus a squared next row has 1 over s plus a so if I multiply by the C matrix I've given here then what do you see you get R1 over S plus A cubed R2 over S plus A squared and R3 over S plus A so your non-simple Jordan form the key thing is you put your repeated pole on the diagonals so that's the same as with the diagonal form but you're adding these one terms in the upper diagonal now one final example let's see what happens if you don't just have repeated poles you also have other poles so if you look at this system the first thing to do is factorize and then do a partial fraction expansion now if I do this is what you get you'll see you've got a 6 over s plus 1 squared minus 2 of s plus 1 minus 6 of s plus 2 so in this particular case the s plus 1 is a double root so I'm going to need a Jordan form for the s plus 1 but not for the s plus 2 so this is what you do if I put a square box around it you'll see the top 2 by 2 box is the Jordan form to cope with this repeated root at s plus 1 and the minus 2 at the diagonal at the bottom is this decoupled mode to deal with the pole at minus 2 if you look at the B matrix you'll see with the non-simple Jordan form we had a 0 and a 1 as the structure we needed but when the elements were diagonal we had 1's everywhere so you'll see the B matrix is not all 1's and it's not all zeros in a single one it's got the 0 1 block to go with the Jordan form and the one to go with a simple diagonal form and finally if we look at the residues the six the minus two and the minus six you'll find that they have mapped across to the C matrix exactly as you expected so the residues for the non simple Jordan form come in the first block and the residue for the minus two is in the last block so a summary we've illustrated how diagonal state space models can be derived from transfer functions with real and distinct roots by first doing a partial function expansion and we've also demonstrated the Jordan form for when you have real and repeated roots I wouldn't recommend the use of diagonal forms if you have complex poles because then you'll have complex numbers in your state space matrix and we don't want to go there <laughs>